everyone. I'm Maria Schumkelin, the Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association. And we have an amazing guest today, Pan Denshom. Thank you so much for joining us. And Pan is twice Oscar nominated filmmaker. Pan is a director, screenwriter, producer, and has worked with such amazing actors as Robin Wright and Morgan Freeman. And we're truly honored to have you here with us. And we're really grateful that you offered to share your words of wisdom and guidance and practical advice. And the first question that we always ask is how did you get started in this industry? Uh, I was born into it. Huh? Uh, my <laughs> mother and father, when I was a little kid, were making short films that went into the English movie theaters. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, I don't think they had the money to be able to hire babysitters. So I think they took me along. And I, I remember being four years old and taken out when my father was filming a woman who kept, co collected and kept alligators and crocodiles in her home. And he was making a film about people who had strange pets. And I ended up riding an alligator in that movie. And um, I, I remember that I can't believe my mother was there because I don't think she would allow me to do it, but that's me on the cover of the book I ended up writing <laughs> about screenplay, uh, screenplay writing. And I, I watched how people responded to a camera um, that you, you're outside somewhere and suddenly a crowd gathers. They want to know what the camera is doing. And my parents took me to the distributors in London and I sat in the theater while they screened the movie with the, th with the distributors. And I'm four years old watching this magic. Mm -hmm. And it was like casting spells. And from that age, I felt like I was Mickey Mouse in Fantasia where you're watching the wizard and you want so much to do that. And all my life, I've just yearned to tell stories with cameras. I have a, if I turn this around, you'd see I have a whole case full of antique cameras. I take photographs to express my emotional journey as a, as a human being and an artist through cameras. And my fa family connection, uh, my mother was a hairdresser and an extra in movies. My father's brother was a twin brother who was a cameraman too. And, and yet when my mother died and I was quite young, my father remarried a very uh, brutally uh, psychotic lady, I will not hold back. And there was a lot of stress and a lot of um, uh, negativity in our house. And the idea of me being creative was shit on. Uh, I was put down for it. Um, and what it did was it created an outsized sense of wanting to support other people's creativity because it's so, it's so fragile at the beginning. You know what an idea is like a tiny little thing. It's like a child and you don't shout at a child for not being able to walk yet. You help to nurture it. And so many people think once you come up with a finished idea, it should be just realized. In, And so what I love doing is trying to share some of the things I've learned about making mistakes, about it not being perfect, but learning as you go. And if I, I jokingly say, if anybody can make it, <laughs> you know, if I can make it, anybody can make it. Uh, just passion has carried me. Uh, no education, never went to film school, um, but I, passionately wanted to learn how to use cameras. I hate mathematics, you know, but I know what a lens does when you do this and you turn the shutter speed this way, or I know how to edit, or I know how to, now I know how to pace and, and, and um, from learning and learning and learning. And um, I get very excited right now because the technology, when we were learning to make films when I was young, we would have to switch on a camera. And every time you switch on a camera, that film went through the camera and cost you money. And here you can take an iPhone and you can make videos at 4K and they can be on the internet or they could be good enough to go on a movie screen and for free. And this is utterly amazing to me. So um, my, my career ended up, I left school at 15, tried to start my own company in England, failed miserably, but I did manage to photograph the Rolling Stones and a couple of things at 17 and would talk my way into things. And I sort of say I fled to Canada. And in Canada, there was a culture there where people shared knowledge about making short films. A lot of young people were all struggling trying to find their way as artists into filmmaking. And, and film is an expensive medium. So you need buyers. You need to make films that have a market. You can't just make them out of thin air. And I worked for a couple of companies and then realized that 
I really wanted the chance to try and create my own company because it gave me the freedom that I, I was a terrible employee, the world's worst employee, being told what to do and not doing it well, as opposed to when I was making my own films with my business partner and we were solving problems because we had to. And we were making films that we really were excited about. And so solving the problems was the route to learning on the job. And we knew if we didn't solve the problems, we didn't finish the film, if we didn't get it marketed, um, we would have to go work for those other people and go back to that joyless process. Yeah. You started as a documentary filmmaker, right? Yes. Yeah. So we actually had questions submitted about documentary filmmaking. Uh, how different is documentary filmmaking from narrative filmmaking in terms of the production process? Well, you're usually much smaller crews. You're more command of the material, but you're also taking what you can find. Mm -hmm. um, we chose when we were making films because uh, I, I just didn't have the courage to write or believe I was any good at drama. I, I left school at 15 failing in my mind, escaping, running away. And um, only my English teacher said to me, I think you really have a great creative mind. And um, everything else about me was scared shitless to write. Um, and uh, after Robin Hood had succeeded, I actually found that guy in retirement and thanked him because I could see a thread of encouragement going back all the way through my life that always kept that possibility I could write a life. And, um, you know, so documentaries, Again, they're, they're, the documentaries that are being made these days are awesome. You know, they're really some astonishing pieces. You know, people making films over, you know, 10 years and putting all the pieces together. Um, you know, it's like, there's no rules. The, the thing is, always find something that fascinates you and try and make it fascinating to the, to the person you're sharing it with. And so for me, working out, my partner would edit, I would shoot frequently and I would use other cameramen that shot in very innovative and energetic, visually strong ways. Because for me, we never wanted to do a documentary with a script where the voice of God tells you what's going on, but we would do documentaries on the most um, flamboyant and um, exciting figure skater that Canada ever put out. There was a guy called Tully Cranston and no one had ever made a film on him before. And so we went and tried to get grants to um, shoot a movie on them. We could only get a tiny little bit of money. So we took that tiny bit of money, went to the world championships, filmed him at the world championships, and then started showing people that and managed to get a sponsor for the film. And again, it was, how did we represent his art? And he is a painter, he's a flamboyant bisexual man. And he also is, um, a absolutely being punished by the, uh, the authoritarian um, people in the skating world who saw it as gymnastics on ice and not dance on ice. And so for us, he was an underdog with all these incredible colors and, and beauty. And so we tried to make a film that reflected his emotional strengths. And um, so I, I would, I, rented a, an ice rink and put long streamers on him and had him dance with these long, this was for ice shows and things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, cut it to music and it's just slow motion. And, you know, so that, that it, it was his joy that we were trying to capture in the film. And again, our, our belief was as a documentary filmmaker, we felt that you still had to have a narrative of some kind, but the biggest discovery we made was that, um, we were being given money by the CBC to make what was called fillers, which are two and three and five minute short films with no spoken narration, with no storyline that they could plug into to movies where they didn't have all the film full time to the hour. And so these things were like leaves floating on a stream or something with some guitar music. And of course we tried to turn them into stuff that was really cool. Mm -hmm. And one, one day I said to my partner, we were going to do something about, it was called, it was going to be called wild flowers. And it was, flowers blowing in the wind to jazz. And um, I said, you know, what if we tried cutting this to the 1812 overture? And we're going, can we do that? Well, we, we found that there's no, that at that time, there was no legal way that the Russians had a copyright on any Russian record of the 1812 overture. So we didn't have to pay music rights. And my friend, uh, John edited this movie overnight 
because we couldn't afford to rent our, our editing systems during the day. So we had to wait till the editors left and then use them at night. And I took slides of flowers and single framed them so that they were spinning and flying. And then we shot sunbeams and we shot, and he edited this to the 1812, which starts off very pastorally and ends up with cannons and chimes and, and, and we were zooming and flashing. And the ending was so exultant that people ex ex applauded this five minute movie. Yeah. And it was blown up and put in the movie theaters and it was reviewed by feature movie reviewers in Canada. And we realized that what we'd done is discovered the orgasm. And we never made a film after that, there was a documentary that didn't peak emotionally. Yeah. Everything we did was hook them at the beginning, tell the story in the most visually tight, fantastically interesting, emotionally truthful to the character and end with, with a flourish that was surprising, wonderful, or uh, absolutely invigorating. Frequently music was the best way to do that. And um, that changed the way that we saw documentaries. We thought the documentaries when you just had a voice narrating a series of facts were very dull. And uh, they, they, we were anti that. We worked in a company that made educational films and we thought they were destroying children's minds, you know? So we wanted to make the films that made you jump with joy and, um, you know, made, made you feel, um, you know, excited when you watch them, so. So how much creative help. freedom, how much creative freedom do you have when you are putting together a documentary? Well, you have as much as your imagination is capable of and carrying it through so nobody guys. understands it. Because there is the biography or factual. How much you, creative you freedom? Have, so, okay, so um, you don't have to tell a story in a linear form. Mm -hmm. There's no rules about that. In fact, we're all so used to the linear form that we can know where the story is going before we get there. So sometimes it's a good idea to take the, sh the deck and shuffle the cards up. So you start with some dynamic moment and then put another moment and then put some counter moment, but it all comes together in your brain when you add it all together, but it was a linear story. But you would just by seeing it out of form, it makes it fascinating again, or it makes the counterpoints of two different things, um, you know, very emotional. You see him being buried and you see him getting married. And those two things together because you intercut the wedding and the, and, the, and the funeral and the people are the same people, you start to get something you couldn't get by being linear. Mm -hmm. And so it comes back again to, uh, we're incredibly visual literate human beings, more than any other species now in terms of um, life experiences being put on the screen daily than, than you know, uh, people who have understood a you know, hundred years ago we're, we're so visually literate that you can put almost anything on a screen and it becomes story if you jam two elements together and you take them as an experiment. And this is the joy of uh, video. You know, you can't lose the edit you've done. It doesn't cost you anything. You're not stripping the tape off and putting it back together. And you're looking at people that you can test it on to see if they get it. But why not make it the most imaginative and strange and beautiful way of telling the story? Because if you tell it linearly, I'm already at the end before you are. Yeah. But that in some cases is necessary. But, you know, again, that's why it's no rules. Each story is its own purpose for the way that material should come out. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned grants for documentaries. Uh, is yeah. There, is that well, something? It, there's, you know, the, the, the great thing about this process is um, you're, you're, you will find that if you search through, there are places that will put money into in the form of grants for arts and for certain perspectives. Um, you, and the pl place also sometimes is to find where there's a need. So if you find that um, working with uh, children with difficulties and there may be grants to make films that help those children. And so you're putting your energy into those places. So you're getting paid to actually learn your business, but you're also doing something valuable at the same time. And again, what we learned about grants was that if you just send in the pages, 90% of the time you don't get the grant. But if you phone up the people that are putting on the thing and you talk to them, you say, what other people have succeeded? Why were they successful? I have these things I'm very passionate about. I'd love to know what it is that I can make my best approach. You start to become a person. And frequently those people are in the room when the grants are being discussed. 
-hmm. And so suddenly your page comes up and it goes, oh, you know, I talked to him. He's really passionate or her. She's really, she's exquisite, you know? And, 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 and it's just human nature. Yeah. We've created rapport. So if you don't phone up and you don't find out and you don't connect, you're not giving yourself the best chance possible. Or if you don't research um, the people that have succeeded before and phone them up and say, why do you think you were successful? Because there, there's no reason not to, if you're respectful and if you really value what they did and you'd like to learn from them, human beings mostly will go along with that. It's true. Is there a specific structure that should be followed in a screenplay uh, to make it an award-winning screenplay in your experience? Well, the difference between award-winning and not is hard because those... Um, Very subjective, yeah. Well, it, it, you, you know, I value the Austin Film Festival. I value the Nichols. Um, it, it, there's one or two others where I really think um, that they're very intentional. And then there are some that I don't think any studio would pay attention to. Um, and so being a winner doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. So um, you're also looking at, um, like in the Austin Film Festival, 7,000 entries. And um, the, the one I most like is the final draft film contest. And those guys are fantastic people. They have got passionately behind the screenplays that they've supported, brought the writers to Hollywood and toured them around. So, um, and I, I'm introduced to the writers every year as a mentor to give them encouragement to take advantage of this moment and not to have what we call imposter syndrome when you think, oh, it's a mistake, it shouldn't have been me, I'm not really good enough, don't ask me any questions. And in fact, the chance is that you've succeeded because you are good. And if you look at your life, you'll see there will be pyramids of success that go back all through your life usually. And, and we, we keep thinking, oh, it'll never happen again. But in fact, it usually is consistent. So um, if, you, if you look at the final draft contest, Again, it's five, 7,000 entries. Now, in our business, I say scripts are like sperm. They're everywhere in Hollywood and they're everywhere all over America now because people are writing them. And the, and the eggs of production are very few and far between. And there's more now because of Netflix and HBO Plus and Disney Plus and things, but um, it's still no indication of a bad script when you don't win an award if you've entered into something that has 7,000 entries. Just, just can't, you can't judge your work that way, but why not enter it? Because if you do win or you get a, a you know, if you, if you get a Nichols, it helps an agent or a manager to look at your work. Um, it helps you to say, I've got a Nichols award, uh, take a look at my script. Um, because those, that's advocacy again, but it's not a solution um, because the solution is finding who will make your movie and trying to share it with them. And um, that's why you write things that are passionate and unique, because if you have a unique voice, then no one else is selling anything like that. And you're the only place they can get that from. And if you've written something and shaped it and done the homework and done the rewrites and done the polish so that your script makes sense. And I, and I, I again, I have all these phrases. Um, you know, I say the first draft is like the Lewis and Clark, which is, you're going on an expedition, you have no fucking idea where it's going, and you have to take all these things along with you, and all your job is to get to the coast. And so writing that first draft should not be, I have to be perfect, I have to lay the road down, I have to put up maps, I have to, no, just get to the fucking coast. Because <laughs> that first draft is you discovering how your story is going to exist. It's not necessarily that you know half the things. And if you try and wait to see what's going to happen, or if somebody says, write a treatment or an outline first, I say, bullshit. You write the way that your soul wants to write it. And my, my stuff comes out and jiggly piggly. I'll have a whole scene come to my head and I just save it till I get to that part of the script. I have the endings of scripts. My Houdini movie was an ending that impassioned me so much. I had to write the rest of it. And for, for a while, I was trying to find someone else to write it because I was too scared to write it because it seemed overwhelming. And so the first draft is get to the coast and then celebrate like fuck because what you've done is manifested an entire story out of nothing. You've rendered dreams into words on a page. And that is an achievement in itself. 
And we, we have to take the successes that we get as human artists when they come because we can't control the selling. There's too many scripts out there. So we can only make sure that by investing ourselves as artists into the material we write, every time we write, we are getting better at being ourselves, at our own voice. And nothing you do is ever lost. Even if you don't get to sell that script, the things that you discovered about your unconscious writing process that'll stay in you like muscles are going to pay off in other movies. So my Mal Flanders movie was like watching all my other movies gyrating around in my head like clockwork. And it was writing itself for five weeks in my spare time. And it was like having sex. It was like so extraordinary. And I, I yearn to have more writing experiences like that. And I have written what I think I was against my nature when we needed money at our company and written a horror movie. And I say it was like plucking words out of my flesh. It was so against who I was. So why wouldn't you want to write to the way that feels sexy and, and, and emotional and passionate? So then you're, you're, um, you're taking that script that you've written, which is now uh, a journey and you now know where you've been you now know what were the emotional things that were valuable to you, but it's still all over the place a little bit. Now the easy part is you put the freeway through. Now you go back through your script because now you know what you've written. It's not perfect, shouldn't be perfect, can't be. You're gonna keep learning as you grow more things out of it. But by putting the freeway through, you're now cutting off the pieces that you went up that past, you didn't need to go there. You've got three characters all doing the same job. Maybe you can bind them into one. You've got a male character that's doing all the boring things that males do. Why not change them into a woman and see what happens? And I've done that in my scripts and radically improved them. Yeah. Um, being a you know, misogynist by, by just sheer physics of my body. And then you go, no, wait a minute, Pan, look at this better than that. And um, then, you, then you end up with, a script that you test on people that aren't buyers. Because if you throw your script at buyers at that stage, there may be one or two simple things you could have fixed and you won't be wasting it. So you go back to the story midwives, people you trust, people you network, writers, groups, things, whatever, and you find what it is that doesn't work. And we've tested movies when we finish them, we edit them and we'll run a test with an audience and there'll be one or two things they don't understand. The numbers are terrible. The studio panics. They think the whole movie's fucked. And then you go back and you fix the points that the, the audience didn't understand, which we call asshole proofing. And that's because their people aren't paying attention. They're not as, as clued in as you are. They're not, their job isn't to be uh, hyper aware. Their job is to be fed, spoon fed the movie. And so if you don't, put all the stepping stones in and they fall in and get wet, they're not going to be able to enjoy it the way you intended it. So discovering what doesn't work and fixing it, which is what I did for the chairman of um, uh, MGM, by, by making the stepping stones all line up, you've got a much better chance of selling your movie. Plus now you've convinced that if you, if you give it to a buyer, it's not gonna embarrass you, it's not gonna let you down. So the, the steps are really um, to expect to have to rewrite, but rewrite is a series of discoveries. It's about how do you make it better? What was I trying to say? Can I say that more clearly? Or can I say it with more energy? Or can I say it in a way that unites another force in the script? And it's not an indication of having failed when you wrote. This is the process. It is the process of discovery to discovery on the baseline of the route that you want to go and adding and changing and discovering new things that make it cohere better. And I'm working on scripts 14, 15, 20 years in some cases that I won't give up on. Um, you know, I was privileged to see the movie Harriet get made, which I initiated many, many years ago and helped develop the original screenplays. And that movie started in 1990 with me. And I hate to tell you that's normal in some cases. When we, when we I'm a member of the, the Producers Guild and um, they bring the 10 nominated films for best picture. They bring the producers in every year for a convention and we all sit in the audience and listen to their stories about how their movies got made. And frequently the movies took 10, 15 years to get made. And, and you're, you're sitting there looking at, you know, the headlines on Variety, another movie gets made going, fuck mine didn't get made. Oh, 
But, you know, the truth is that it's like a battery. It's never been run down either. And unless someone's making the other movie on uh, Christopher Columbus or something when that two came out at the same time, you know, unless they've used up your space, your movie is fully charged, ready to go. It's just a matter of figuring out how to plug it into the system so it can light something up. You've mentioned going through some challenging failures. Uh, how did you deal with that? Everybody goes through that along this path. This is just the path where you have to expect it, but it doesn't mean that you don't get upset. So right. how did you deal with that emotionally? How did you handle the failures emotionally? Well, I, I, I say the biggest um, mistake I make was my errors of omission. My failures, which I am most upset about myself, are the ones where I didn't try. Mm where I talked myself out of something because I thought it might be embarrassing or I, I, I thought I wasn't good enough and didn't put myself forward. And those things are not a fair estimate of what one is actually capable of. And I think our brains have a system that's trying to protect us, which is a little nag, a little anxiety thing, which says, oh, don't do that. Oh, no, no. And it's there to protect you from walking into a cave and getting eaten by a bear. But in modern life, what it's saying is, oh, don't send that email with that request for some help because they might think you're an idiot. And, and, and so my biggest failures have been when I didn't try. And I carry those with me. And I've been embarrassed a few times by trying things when um, they didn't work, but they've cost me a lot less than the times when I didn't try. That's 100% guaranteed failure. And there's a couple of times when I've been able to do things which were outright rejection outright absolute flaming rejection and I was so passionate about the material I had so much was a dream to try and accomplish it that I then went back and tried to figure out how to change the result I got and two or three times changed them radically and if we want to talk at length about that I'll talk about it but um, I, I uh, and I, it will be a length I'm sorry if this is boring no, that's but, great um, <laughs> The I more you're willing to share of your personal struggles, you know, we can learn from them. Well, one, one of the things I like to say is ignore everything I say that goes against your intuitions because they're sacred. The things that keep you going can sometimes be very small, little dreamlike things. I've written entire screenplays because I just got four lines at the end of a movie. And, and if I told that to somebody and they had said, oh, that's stupid, I would never have written it. Whereas I tell those four lines to my assistant, who is a lady who got a thesis uh, in Brown University on she rose, and we both tear up. And that four lines becomes the whole compass for a, for a story that my body was yearning to write. Now that sounds crazy. Um, and if you told me that I would write out of some kind of spiritual soul process years ago, I would have said, that's stupid. But what I've learned is that the films that I let myself write that seem not to be in the mainstream, that don't seem to fit some formula. You know, you're told to write a horror movie. Why? Because they sell. But is it your nature to write a horror movie? Are you going to write the best horror movie that full of the noir and the understanding of fear and the things that it teaches the human beings about the dark side of humanity and being a hero to overcome? No, because you don't like that stuff. But you might write a dance movie that is so wondrous because that is in your sinews, but you don't know it's in your sinews unless you start letting it out. So I say, um, write dangerously, write to the things you're scared of because people might not understand them, but your job is to write and then sell them on what you've written. You can't abandon what you've written because if you don't, and I call it building a bridge backwards to the buyer, if you don't teach the buyer why something is good, you failed your work because they're not smart enough sometimes to see what you see. So after writing Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which was yeah. a film I wrote um, out of frustration, um, I had the privilege of having a son with my wife, a child, and we were watching movies at that time with Schwarzenegger and Stallone killing human beings, you know, like target practice, like bowling pins. And I'm looking at how much effort it takes to raise a kid, how much courage it is to have children, and I wanted to make a movie that said something optimistic about life. And I decided that Robin Hood was a film that I could use or a, st or a story to carry a couple of things that I wanted to speak to as a human being. 
And I pitched a story to three studios, all of whom told me it was the stupidest idea they'd ever heard. No one wants to see guys with swords. They only want to see guys with guns. And no one wanted to buy it. And even my partner at that time thought it wasn't going to work. And I had this vision of putting an Arab, a Muslim, side by side with a Christian, so that here was two people who would normally be considered enemies actually helping themselves to take on an evil. And there was another element in it, which is I wanted to make a film where a, um, essentially it, it was the difference between killing and actually saving lives. And I called, I wanted to make a film about the maker of life as opposed to a taker of life. And so, and these are instincts that are not like, oh yeah, absolutely certain, no, I'm doing this. This is like these weird little intuition things that cause you to go down the threads until they sort of weave together. And I wanted to make a film where a man's courage or a woman's courage to fight for other people's futures was being celebrated. So Robin Hood for me was a journey from a spoiled asshole, a kid that was raised by a rich, wealthy baron and told he could get away with anything and he ends up being willing to die for the future of his peasants' children. And that was my model for what that movie was about. And no one wanted me to write it. Our assistant, was a guy called Mark Stern, looked at some of my projects and said, you know, that Robin Hood thing sounds really wonderful. I will love to support you. If you start writing, I'll just do my best to be your ally. And that is the reason I started writing Robin Hood. And Three quarters of the way through, my other partner, John, who hadn't been able to, and, and, and to see how some of these elements could work, the idea of a Muslim and a Christian, and as he saw my pages coming out, became another tremendous ally. And in fact, he did a lot of the polishing on the script and we ended up co-sharing the screenplay credit. Um, and he also became a fantastic producer on the movie that we ended up getting made. And we went from, being no movie at all, to a point where there was four competing Robin Hoods in Hollywood, all trying to get made. And, and the idiocy of that is, who knows? But the truth was that movie really was emotionally meaningful to me. And three quarters of the way through John working on the screenplay, which was over Christmas, we heard that there was a, another Robin Hood and it was greenlit and it had John McTiernan and the director of Die Hard on it, and Fox was gonna make it. And John didn't wanna finish the script. And I, I honestly bullied him. I said, we gotta finish it because I did not wanna give up on my dream. Yeah. And I, I feared that I'd given up on a couple of other dreams where, where in the best will in the world, people had tried to talk, them out, talk me out of them because they couldn't understand how they could be successful. And that's that, that dilemma for an artist is, that's why I say write dangerously, write the most potent, passionate, unique voice that you can develop and then figure out how to sell it because they don't know. And if you don't make the effort to teach them how to sell, they won't get it. But if you can figure out how to teach them to sell what you've created so that they look good selling it, then you can sell your material. So I say that, Half of the effort and sometimes is actually not giving up on your material, but actually finding ways that you can calibrate it until the buyer sees themselves succeeding in. And we'll, we can talk about pitching later on. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one rejection. Um, I then had this gut instinct, which is absolutely stupid, but I knew, and I had this physical mental sausage in my gut that was like a story that I didn't know what it was, except I knew it was a historical character. I knew it was a woman and I knew the story wanted to come out of me. And I, for two years, was reading about historical women. Mal Flanders was the end result, but the beginning I looked at Melly Malone and Nell Gwynn and other historical women. And um, I was listening to the radio one day and I heard a story on the radio <clears throat> about an orphans and foundlings home in England that was now turned into a museum and they had letters that were left with babies that had been abandoned on the doorsteps. And I wonder what a woman would write to a child she might never see again. And I found myself thinking four lines of a movie, which was the ending, which was to a little girl who's like six years old, who's a waif and has come from an orphanage has been taken out of it. 
and a very wealthy woman is talking to her and says, what say you child now you've heard your mother's story and I'm assuming the child's been read the letter <clears throat> and the child says, um, you could throw me out without a crust to eat before I would deny that woman is worthy of my love. And then the mother, the woman says, um, prepare yourself child for I am that woman, I am your mother. Right. And I knew at that point that I wanted to tell a story where a woman wanted her child who she'd accidentally have been forced to abandon to know every flaw about it. So that when the child loved her, it was absolutely solid and not a trick and not a fake, but it was the love of a person who knew everything about her, her, her mother and then it was true. And that, those lines uh, I only shared with my assistant who was a woman. And then um, I started writing in secret and I wrote the story of Mal Flanders, which is what that script became, uh, while doing all my normal work because I knew my partners couldn't figure out what I would be trying to do writing a woman's story. And that ended up, that that movie ended up getting made with Robin Wright and Morgan Freeman, me directing it. And it was the most passionate thing of my life. And it still is the most passionate thing I've done. I've made movies that are very commercial, but that movie spoke to things about me and life and love and women. And I see it as being a story dedicated to my daughter about being flawed and being imperfect and still worthy of absolute love yeah. as a woman. Yeah. Um, and that movie, when, we, when I finished the screenplay, I gave it to the head of UA and we had a deal with UA MGM and um, the material in it, it made me cry when I read it. Um, and it wasn't formula, it was not, and I called it Mal Flanders because we used some of the material from Mal Flanders as I realized that that story had really accurate um, historical details and things that I could use and character elements that were really rich. And it also was a title that gave the story the ability to be sold as opposed to Penn's historical woman story. And um, we gave it to the head of UA and he read it and said, I don't get it. And I went back and I met with him and I begged him to reread it and I explained all the passions and things because I yearned for it to get made and me directing it. And he said, I reread it and I still don't get it. And when we actually screened the movie, he's sitting next to me, he says, oh, now I get it. Yeah. So then my partner, John, gave it to the head of MGM because I was giving up. And he said, no, no. And I said, MGM's not going to make my movie. They do films about talking dogs. You know, it's not like this, this is a classical historical drama. And he, and he sent it off. And the president of MGM phoned me up and said, I love your script. I want to make it. I want it in the movie theaters next December for Christmas. And I go, holy crow, this is fantastic. Two days later, his assistant phones up and said, we've reviewed our um, options and we won't be making it. And I go, oh, God. So I did the thing which is absolutely insane. I phoned up the chairman of the board and I said, could I meet with you? And that's what I mean about, you have to be crazy. You have to have your blood in the script to do these things, which is why you write a script that you didn't care about because you thought it was just gonna be what the conventions were and your passion and blood isn't in it. You're not gonna do that. So then I asked to meet with the chairman of the board. <laughs> and you know, there was a slight thing because he had been working in Canada when we were there, running Paramount's Canadian distribution system. And we hadn't met him, but he had actually paid to have one of our theatrical short films blown up to 35 mil to go in the theaters. And that was about the only link. And the fact that our company and, and had, had been brought in under their wing to develop projects for them. And my partners were scared because I'm now gonna go confront the chairman of the board. We might lose our deal. So I go and I'm ready to beg him to read my script and give him my pitch. And he starts immediately and he says, you know, when Maul starts to drink, I think she just becomes such a bitch that no one would want to see the movie. And I go, oh, bugger me. I hadn't figured out why they said no. <laughs> and so I'm now facing the guy who is saying that I'm not going to get my movie made. And in Canada, when we were making short films, the Kodak representative used to come around every week or two and try and sell us more film stock. And it was always humiliating and embarrassing because we didn't have any money to buy film stock unless we were making movies or we'd buy a little bit 
shoot a little bit of a movie, then go try and find some more money. And so I said to him, you know, what you guys should do is teach us to sell. And he said, seriously? And the head of Kodak came and met with me and they put on a sales course for filmmakers. And one of the key things was eliminate the objections. In other words, when you're actually in a situation and somebody's saying no, ask them why they're saying no and see if you can provide an answer that's actually truthful to their needs. Don't never, you never put them down for the answer. You try and provide a truthful answer, hearing what they're questioning. And if you go through that process, you will eliminate the objections. Mm -hmm. And so the Kodak course switched on in my head. And I'm saying to the chairman of the board, oh, well, it wasn't my intention that you would not love her. Um, I wonder how I failed to get that point across. And he goes, well, you did the And I said, and the key thing about the Kodak course was always dig for more because people don't volunteer their objections necessarily because they might think they're foolish or they might think that you're, they're intruding on your goodwill or they, and so you actually have to dig for the rejections. And so I'd said, yeah, I understand that. Was there anything else that really didn't work for you? And I discovered he read the whole script. He said, well, I didn't like that. Da, 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 and, I, da, da, da. and then you go, and yes, and was there anything else? And I'm trying not to sound like some kind of machine, but I'm trying to sound like I'm in a really caring and uh, honest relationship dialoguing, trying to understand what this man's motivations were and what he needed in order to be able to make that script work for him. And he fi finally finished. I went away and rewrote it in three days and gave it back to him. Now that set my partners really nuts because now I've been rejected by the three people that run the three divisions of, of MGM and I'm still afraid when he's sticking it right back in there. And I'm in an office at MGM and the chairman walked by, his name was Frank Mancuso. And it was like the principal of my high school going, you, my office. And I remember that's usually when you got caned. And I go in and he said, you know, that script's the best script I've ever read. I want to make it. I'll make it like Remains of the Day. You get me two stars and I'll finance the movie. Wow. So I, I'm sorry it's so long-winded, but in a way it's sort of important to see I'm scared shitless while I'm doing that. I'm not confident. Mm -hmm. And you see people doing things. I have to, I have to work up all oh my gut. And then what I also look at is who else can give me input that gives me strength. And I will share my work very carefully because there are people that don't have the imagination to see what it can become. And there are what I call story midwives, people who are soulful, who are creative and can get where you're trying to get to without cutting your legs off and telling you, well, if only you'd done it this way, you know, um, what they're really, the best note you ever get is one that makes you smile. And they say, you know, do you ever think that if you did that, that script would be even stronger as opposed to why did, why did you do that? Because that's not a good note. And so I sort of charge at my batteries to go take the rejections um, because that's the only way I can take them. And after two or three rejections, then I need to recover. And then I might tweak and rewrite a little bit uh, or I might try and reframe how I'm trying to sell my material. Um, uh, so uh, the, the thing I learned was that the buyer doesn't know. You have to help them. Wow. And be proactive. I mean, this is <laughs> this is very impressive. This is beyond proactive, but that's very encouraging to those. Well, I've, I've, I've failed myself many, many times, Maria. Many more times than these few suggested that to actually work. But yeah. the ones that work are the things that give you the faith to keep trying. Uh, I've got three projects right now. I would like to make. They're all slightly off center, and I'm trying to figure out again. I call them framing devices. How do I present them in a manner which the buyer sees them as being something that they can benefit from? Because the head of a studio isn't looking, how can I make Pendentium's movie? I'm an old has-been probably in their minds until you show them something that they go, oh, wait a minute, that could make money. That could make me look good. That could have a good social impact. That, you know, I, I know that a star that desperately needs something like that. And so the goal is to help the buyer sell by not, not to see yourself as outside the process, but to see yourself as inside. And we get emails daily. Oh, I've got a horror movie or I've got a so-and-so movie. None of them ever make the effort to try and figure out why I should want it. Mm. None of them say, oh, I know you did Houdini, which is historical, Robin Hood, which is historical, Mal Flanders, which is historical. And I have this story that I think is just absolutely amazing. I would love to share it with you. And maybe, you know, 
No one ever does that. Wow. They've not researched me. They don't know who I am. They're just trying to send out a thousand emails thinking that that's how you sell. And you don't. You just get a thousand rejections from people that ignore you because you're just clutter in their email system. Yeah. And there are people who will sell you email lists. And, you know, the difference between a letter that cares and a letter that ignores the person is the difference between succeeding and not succeeding at getting noticed. How do you get yourself to sit down and do it? Because as a writer, you have so many things going on in your head and you want them all simultaneously on paper now <laughs> where you have to sit down and actually do the typing and it's discouraging because you really, you really want the project in front of you. And then as you start writing, sometimes self-doubt kicks in and you yeah. stop writing. How do you ensure you get through the process? Like you said, to that, to that ending, <laughs> how do you get well, it, it's first of all, again, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. Each of us has our own places and things that give us the inspiration to keep going. Uh, my son is a writer and he hates it every day some days and I hate it some days. Um, and I say the scripts don't write themselves. So you have to invest in them. Um, there's a chapter in my book, um, which is Yes, But Can I Write, which uh, I persuaded to let my, for my publishers to let me give away for free. And so I have a website and I'm not shilling my book. I'm not trying to get people to buy my book, but if you want a free chapter that inspires you to write, then this is the best I can do. And if you go to writingthealligator.com, there are two things you can download for free. One is the chapter on writing, which talks about the uniqueness of each individual. We're all instruments that no one knows how to play. And so what we have to do is discover what makes us work best. And so if going off to the attic and um, you know, having two shots of whiskey or something is what makes you write, then God bless you, that's what you do, but it wouldn't work for me. But there isn't a right way to write. Plus I address writer's block in that. Um, and I found this piece of um, advice in a, an Australian website by a guy who was writing copy for um, selling projects, products, I think. And he said, write a piece of crap. So when you set out to write something that's so elevated you can't achieve it, you freeze up. It says, if you just look at it as a piece of crap, just get it out of you. And it's very true. You know, we, we're always aiming up here, which tightens everything up. Whereas you say, just write the fucking thing. And so if you write, what happens is the next day you look at it and go, oh, I can fix that. Oh, oh this is much better than I thought it was. Because the nag in you will constantly pick on what you're writing, telling you it's awful, it's a waste of time, it's horrible, why are you doing this? There are real people that do this for a living. And that nag just no actual ability to judge what you're writing. It's mm -hmm. just an automatic pilot constantly moaning. And you can actually, people have said, they told their nags to go away or told them to talk like Donald Duck or so that they can't, you know, because this brain part of it seems to be a human condition. And writing out of not questioning whether it's good or not lets you get in touch with your unconscious. And our unconscious is a rich, rich, deep lake of possibilities. It's so full of things that we don't yet know, full of currents and surfaces that are from our existence as a human being, from our DNA, from our life and culture, and from the things that screwed us up. And I didn't know this for years, but I'm on the set of Mall Flanders, and my partner says to me, how come none of your characters have mothers? I go, I'm writing about a woman who has lost her daughter and a, had written a character whose mother got pregnant to the guards of a prison because in England they would keep you alive as long as you were pregnant and then hang you. And so uh, Robin Hood has no mother. Houdini lost his mother and then went to psychics trying to get her back. And, um, you know, I, it, it's just unconsciously I'm writing to re reclaim something of my uh, lost life and these things that when I let them come out of me are richer, more textured, more full of human emotion. Uh, whereas when I'm trying to contrive something, it doesn't have those threads, that deepness. Um, so I also fervently believe that we as, as, as uh, a, a species write in three act structures. And um, I, I was reading um, about a guy um, who, his name is Paul Zax, and he's a professor, and he studies oxytocin, which is the trust chemical. 
which you're trying to set off when you first embrace a pitch. You're trying to get that oxytocin, get the guy out, get this lady happy, tell her that she's got really truthful things you admire. That sets off oxytocin, which is the warm trust chemical. Well, he studied that, but what he also did was he put on a, a study where he took students and showed them a short film with a three-act structure and a separate film without a three-act structure. And he took blood samples before and after. And he found that the three-act structures changed, the cortisol levels went up, the oxytocin levels went up, and the person's sense of trust and bonding with people went up. And what, what you look at is, why would that be? And because I think what it is, is organically, as a human primate, we create stories and they come out in three-act structures. And so if you surrender to writing, there's a damn good chance you'll write something that's formulated close to a three-act structure, and then you'll move the pieces around, you'll edit and you'll tweak and you'll find better ways of illustrating. But that, I think, will be null. And then it's why do we have a three-act structure? And what is it that, that we're doing when we're watching a movie and what is going on? And again, I, I, I'm so excited to understand this stuff, but we have things called mirror neurons in this. And mirror neurons fire up when we watch other human beings doing behaviors in the same places as if we were doing those behaviors. And um, I worked when I was very, very young with a guy called Marshall McLuhan. And Marshall McLuhan uh, and Buckminster Fuller and one or two other names of that era were like the gurus of communications or the gurus of technology. And Marshall McLuhan um, was working with us making a couple of films and I was privileged and he said, look at the audience watching a movie. What are you seeing? And you go, uh, I see people in a trance. They're not conscious, they're in a dream state and they're moving their mouths with the, with the expressions of the people on the screen. And you go, what's going on here? A baby moves its mouth mimicking its mother's expressions from the moment it's born. What's going on here? Well, what's going on is they found that as a species, we're a highly um, bonded species. We've learned to live in small herds. And what we've done is in order to live in those herds, we've had to find ways of communicating and being able to work together because as a group, some group goes off and hunts, another group grows and all our children survive. Everything was about surviving the genes. But if we couldn't read the other people, so empathy, is when we watch someone else expressing emotions, we micro move our own faces matching their expressions. And that's how we create a knowledge of what they're thinking. And if a bad actor comes up and doesn't make us move our face, we don't like their work. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing when we're giving in to acting that is working is there are micro expressions, there are micro little dots of emotions that go over our faces. And those truths are what make us feel the internal journey. Now, what are we doing when we're watching that internal journey is we're adjusting our own life behaviors to be more successful. And so they say that all drama is conflict. Well, conflict is where people are adapting to change that is against their opportunities and using strategies to get through it. I wanna marry this woman. Well, that's a conflict because she doesn't wanna marry me. How do I win her over? Well, we are designed to observe and learn from other people's conflicts so that we don't actually have to do it. And that's what stories purpose is, is to teach us things while we watch those people, but we're not conscious of it. We're conscious of enjoying the story. But if you look backwards into your brain, you'll see your mirror neurons are firing off and you're asking yourself questions about your own life as you're watching the people on the front of the screen struggling to get to deal with their issues. And it's no, it's no surprise to me that we call Hollywood the dream machine because I believe that the design of a movie is to put you in a trance state so you're transported into the world of those characters in order to be able to learn how to make your own life better. Wow, that's an amazing parallel between psychology and screening, right? Not even parallel, just connection between psychology and screening. Most people that you, you, who are teaching you about screenplays have no idea why you're writing. Yeah. They have no idea that the, the purpose of writing is to allow people to see an illustration of possible outcomes of opportunities mm -hmm. that would make our lives better through the character's behavior. 
And if you understand that and you surrender, which I come back to, I believe if you surrender organically to the most dangerous way you could write, the most extreme version of your artistic instincts, there's a good chance there will be conflicts in there that you will cause me to want to be a part of so I can learn more about myself. Wow, that's, that's really deep and an amazing perspective. On, on writing and amazing way to approach writing you just kind of release yourself on paper and it, wow that's really great thank you it's so subjective how do you know how to improve as a screenwriter is it just about discovering your voice and getting better as who you are as a person while you learn yourself through writing or is it certain structures that you have to start mastering and getting better or what's the process in this subjective world to improve boy that's so hard because you know i think um screenwriters screenwriting is like playing music and it's like saying well which is a good piece of music uh, jazz you know some people write jazz <laughs> and they love it and and they may have a small market for it but they're absolutely great at it and someone else is going to write rock and roll and, um, you know, if I was to tell them how to write that and I'm a jazz guy, I'm going to screw them up. So my, my, that's why I say write dangerously, but also, you know, do read scripts that have been successful and gotten made because they do show you the system. Don't follow the rules of being so rabid about layout and structure and mores and continues. And the first script is the one that sells. And it's not about writing a production script, which is so many of these idiots that want to mentor you and charge you money. A production script is something that you budget on. But the script that sells, it should be like poetry on the page. I don't care how it comes out of you. If you write a script that doesn't have all the things that a normal script has, but it makes somebody buy your movie, that's what works. Nothing else works. If you don't buy it, they don't buy the movie, you know, so there's a lot of rules and rigidity about the educational side of making you uh, hit the uh, plot point turn at page 15. It's like, yeah, okay, but that's not going to sell your movie. Yeah. But there are simple things. If you don't start a movie with a bang, if you don't pick up that script and the reader goes, oh, wow, when they pick it up, you're letting your script down. You've put two years into this project and you've written the most boring opening paragraph in the world. That's not smart. That, you know, I say scripts are the enemy of the reader. They go home on a weekend. Somebody's given six scripts to read. They've got a kid they want to go play with. They've got a wife who wants to go out to dinner. And your script's between them and that. So when they open it and it goes, you know, oh, my God, it's about what color the curtains are in the kid's room because, the, you know, as opposed to a hand blasts through glass and pulls somebody back through it. You know, the difference is what am I going to read? which if I have to open up my life and look at scripts, I'm going to read the one that grabs me. And I say that, you know, if you want to, you want to know what it is, is that psychologically you're creating a contract with your reader. Mm -hmm. And it's the, it's the Raiders of the Lost Ark principle. Throw a big chase on the screen and then back off and talk in the, in the lecture room. Mm -hmm. And if you just talk in the lecture room, I have no idea that you're going to make me excited again further down the ring because that uh, that opening is really a disposable element so make sure that your movie has a very strong grabby opening something emotional something different something that just invests that first page is dynamic and then the audience the reader will look at you and say oh that's pretty cool what else is going on as opposed to, oh god i had to get through that and you know, the difference is small because your script is still going to be good, but it's much better. And even if you have something way down in the body of the movie, it's absolutely mind blowing. Consider putting that up on page one and just start it. And then, you know, put two weeks earlier because you made me want to know because a script is a giant question. It's a puzzle. It's a mystery. A good script, you open and go, well, what's going to happen? And if I tell you what's going to happen, there's no point in reading it. So I have to create one and oh. I have to create this energy, this idea that's going to unravel. And it's like a series of puzzles and clues. But if I put that down as rules, someone would be, oh, I'm not writing puzzles and clues. I think those things come na naturally. You have to write from your organic nature and then tweak it to make sure that you're following those guidelines, not the other way around. Don't throw the issues of making it right into the work. 
get to the end. Then look at just your dialogues. You know, I mean, one of the ways of rewriting a script is just to look at some very simple questions. Some of them are, and again, this is like, because I'm lazy. I don't like working. So I came up with very simple questions. When I've written my draft, I go, can I get into this scene later? Can I get out of this scene earlier? Because if I can get into the scene later, maybe I don't have all the fuddle duddle that I didn't need, so I can just get to the strength and the meat of the scene. The third question is, is the scene increasing in interest? And if it isn't, that's not a good scene. So then you've got, you, you know you have to go there, but if somebody says, hey, we found the gun, oh my goodness, where was it? As opposed to, we've got to find that gun, what are we going to do? And someone says, oh, we found it. That's the builds to it. And the difference is just mechanics. It's just pure, how do I keep your interest? And then the next thing is getting out of a scene early. My God, we got to find the gun, what happened? And then you cut, you don't say we had the answer. We go, and then we cut to a man lifting a gun and firing it to test it. Mm -hmm. And now what we've done is we've cut off the boring part and we've left us suspended and we're trying to go from suspense to suspense. And that, that again is you can't do that until you've got a whole story. And now you can start to noodle it around a little bit so that it gets easier. And then the same thing with dialogues. You know, if you just look at your dialogues when you finished your script, and you just look at your dialogues, you'll see frequently you've written a uh, weller before your sentence, or you've written three sentences to say something that only really needed to be said in one sentence, but you needed to write it as a human being to discover what your characters were saying. And now you have the privilege of just reading the dialogues and saying, have I overwritten this? Is this, can I make this more interesting by maybe taking the first and the last sentence, cutting them in half and putting them together? What happens? Because what you're looking to do is to be potent. You're looking to be energetic. You're looking to be imaginative with the words like, so that it, it, it keeps our interest. And um, again, it, it sounds, I hope it sounds easy um, because if you do this, you're not overwhelmed. And your script, you know, every word you can get out of your script, every word you get off the page lightens it. And I call it like a hot air balloon. Every sandbag you can throw over the side that doesn't need to be read makes the balloon rise faster. And the whole goal is to keep your audience in that script until it's, so it's the point where it's just the most perfect ending. And then we very brutally call endings orgasms. If you've taken me to bed in your script and I don't have an orgasm at the end, you let me down. And an orgasm could be anything that makes a dramatic, potent finish. Rocky II, we fixed up. We made the orgasm, the fight work. In Star Wars, the orgasm is the fight. But in a, in a movie where it's a trial, the people are finally at the last second found innocent. And the emotions of those people are the surprise, the wonder, or the confession that you never saw coming. So endings make an audience believe the whole thing worked. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't have to do that on our first draft or our second draft because I'm working on scripts I've done 20, 30, 40 drafts of, and they're not like total rewrites, although some are when I totally restructure and try and find that thing that makes me want to get it to an audience and make it work. But sometimes you just get the position to be able to step back. And honestly, the best ideas come when you're in the shower. I always recommend take a shower and you can't solve a problem because somehow or other, when you tie the brain and the body up separately, the brain frequently gurgitates out concepts and ideas that it can't get out when it's in a normal status. And um, I also believe in putting music on. I also believe in watching a movie that is like the film that you're going to try and write or that you're writing. If you're doing a detective movie and you watch detective movies, you're suddenly going to get ideas in your head you saw the detective hide his gun in the, in the, in the uh, glove box in the movie and you go, no, no, I don't wanna do that, but I'm gonna have it stick it in his sock and I never had that idea before. So he's gonna, you know, so it's like you, you're, it helps you when you're looking at what other people have done because we build on the, on the backs of the successes. You know, if we know what um, Sunset Boulevard is and we know that the movie starts off with a dead man talking and we see him in the water and, and he suddenly go, ooh, yeah, mine's fairly obvious. Why don't I start off with, we don't know if this guy's dead or alive till the end of the movie. You know, it's just, it's just these things happen to you. Yeah. Uh, you have to love it. Yeah. 
So self-doubt is okay. Yeah, oh God, yes. It's what we have to overcome. And, and that's why I wrote a chapter in my book as well about stress and the good side of it, because we can't escape stress. Mm -hmm. Stress is a driving mechanism. And people look at different people and they say, well, why is he succeeding so much? And I'm looking at myself and saying, I don't, I'm not working hard enough. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that uh, ambition and drive are things that some people just naturally don't have and they're painful. Yeah. I'm not going, hey, I'm successful. I'm going, what I haven't done yet. Yeah. I hate myself for not having done enough. Mm -hmm. So part of this again is, you know, don't do it if you don't like it because it's not worth it. You know, if your dream is to make these films and to share dreams and to do things and all the other pain is worth it, then it makes sense. And if it doesn't, don't do it because, you know, you could have a much nicer life being a lawyer and just everybody hires you as the next job. No one says to a lawyer, well, you're only as good as your last case. No, they, they keep getting hired. Whereas in our business, hey, what was your last movie? Oh, okay, well, thanks. We'll speak to you again another time. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. That's a career to love to get into. Yeah, you have to. And, and, and the reward is also important to be around other people who get what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Networking, sharing, I only reason I'm in my business is that one of my friends and I, you know, I was still a friend years later, tipped me off that the, the CBC was going to have this series and they were gonna put 10 grand up for filmmakers um, to, to go make a movie of their choice. And that was, they accepted my drama and that I would never been able to do a drama under any other circumstances in Canada because we hadn't done one before. Mm -hmm. And it, it was the risk I took. So I've, I've broken down pitching and pitching again, this is from years and years. And, and also I have taught a couple of times. Um, my, my life changed when Norman Jewison, who was a very famous filmmaker from Canada, saw my very first dramatic short and decided that he would offer me the opportunity to be mentored by him in Hollywood, which scared the pants off me. Uh, I had a company with my partner who was 10 years old we were making shorts and TV specials. And to suddenly be given the chance to go to Hollywood was staggeringly strange. And my wife and I were happy in, in Toronto, but I knew I had to make the jump. So I went to learn and it changed my life. And so I try and give back to people because their lives too could be changed being offered opportunities that they didn't even know they could grow into. And that, that pitching thing comes out of years of trying to figure out how do you get to the goal of where you want to be. And pitching, I came down to teaching it because I wanted to help other filmmakers. And it came down to four points, really simple points. One is identify your buyer. If you don't identify your buyer, and if you don't look them up, if you don't read interviews about them, if you don't read other movies they've made, you don't know how to create a rapport with them. And people are going to pay attention to somebody who actually acknowledges what they've achieved. So if I say to you, Maria, I know that you've got these wonderful things you're doing with children and that you're changing people's lives and that you have got a dream to actually also make filmmakers in, 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 your, in your state succeed, you're gonna to listen to what I say next. Yeah. But if I haven't said anything, if I haven't learned anything, hey, I just want you to do this. There's no rapport. There's no understanding of your goals. How can I win you over? So the first thing I say is research your buyer. Learn things that you can authentically and truthfully say that compliment them, that you believe are valuable things. And I say, if you don't know um, how to reach somebody, write a letter. Because letters are so rare these days. People put letters on the door, the desks of directors or producers or agents or executives because they're so rare. And no one makes the effort. Everyone wants to send an email, which is free and easy. You don't even know if the email went into spam or not. So if I say write a letter, it's because I've seen people that I've mentioned this to succeed this way. They get noticed. So the first part of your letter is to flatter, honestly, flatter the person that you're going to try and sell to by telling them the truth that you admire their work, that you think they've done some astonishing things, and you have something you'd like to share with them. The second rule I have, and these are simple rules, demonstrate passion. 
I say to my, my classes I used to when I was teaching pitching was, you can be almost incoherent if you're passionate. And people understand that the passion is bubbling up in you and it makes you dynamic. And I'm curious now, I wanna know what it is that's got you so excited and I'll help pull the story out of you to find out Whereas if you're cold and you're antithetical to, you know, you say, no, oh, horror movies are selling, so I decided to write one. Yeah, that's not gonna work, <laughs> you know? So I say demonstrate passion um, because that, that reason in you, that human part of the nature of why you wanted to do something becomes part of why they will buy in. Mm -hmm. And so I created this kind of model to teach pitching and so I would say, and this is not truthful, but it's, it's a way of teaching. I'm in the room. I've said I've read, I've seen the scripts that you uh, have got made into movies. You've done some astonishing things. I also know your kids went to my kid's school and you know, isn't that cool? So now we have rapport with people as opposed to distance. Then the next thing I say, you know, um, I wanted to pitch you a project and this is how it started. And it's because my wife had a dream and it was a nightmare and apparently kept her up two or three nights in a row and then she shared it with me. It was so freaking scary. It actually kept me up. And I thought, oh, I'm going to try to turn that into a movie. Now, that's my demonstration of passion. I'm not going to let my wife down. It's unique. Uh, I've got a reason to follow it through. Or it could be some entirely different thing. I'm working on a project with dolphins right now. And my passion is I want to say something about preserving the oceans. Um, so I say demonstrate passion. And then the third one is illustrate the success that this movie could be before you pitch the story. So, that, and I call it goalposts. Find two movies that are very powerful successes because you're trying to bring that person who's got another appointment after that. His wife's yelling at him for not bringing the cleaning home. He's got a boss that wanted to see the dailies on the thing and he knows the dailies are late and he's worrying about it. And so if you don't do the work of bringing the, the material to him, or her in a way that is simple for them to grasp, you're letting yourself down. So I say, create two ideas of films that your film is analogous to. Mm -hmm. And right now my dolphin project is sort of, um, is sort of Free Willy meets Tarzan. Nice. And I've now put up two goalposts and I kick my movie through them. You understand what it is. I don't have to go have them say, what is it? I don't understand. You know? so, in this particular instance, then in my pitch session, I say, I'm going to pitch you a story that is that, that came out of my wife's dream. It is sort of halfway between Alien and The Exorcist. Now, what executive doesn't want to have hits like that? What executive doesn't understand that those were giant audience pleasing movies? And even though they were a long time ago, that's still an incredibly powerful symbol of what success was. Now, just by putting that up, and then I pitch my story and my story it isn't one that I've actually sold or it isn't one I've actually written, but it's just, I say, and my story is NASA finds an alcoholic defrocked priest and they take him to the moon because people are getting possessed up there and they found the devil's bones up there. And I, I've, in four steps, I've taught you how to sell. And if you don't make it personal, if you don't have the passion and you don't have the ability to define what the success could be for the buyer, you're missing out on all the things that will get your story paid attention to. Wow. I told you I was long-winded, I'm sorry. No, that is great. I mean, I'm already seeing everyone jotting down the lists and putting together beautiful letters. I think the letter idea is genius. I mean, probably should be even handwritten letter, not? Well, you know? well it, it should be easy to read. Yeah. Whatever you do, Throw no obstacles. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> sure. <laughs> really simple. Um, but if you have beautiful handwriting, I think handwritten letters. Good handwriting, great. Right? Because uh, um, and and the goal is, you know, not necessarily to ask them to buy, but to ask for advice, because people will talk about advice a lot easier than wanting to reject you. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have to go in a confrontational place. But if you say. I'm so much in awe of what you've achieved. I got this project. I'd love your advice on where you, how, you know, because advice is a low threshold. Yeah. Plus another thing that's helpful is, are there any advocates that you can mention when you're, when you're approaching somebody? Can you say that my film school teacher says I've written the best script of the three, four years he's ever been? And because that advocacy 
or like winning awards, helps people to value what you're going to give them and see it as something with a, with a gold glow around it. And again, when we were making short films, we learned that the government was making films called the National Film Board in Canada. And they were always saying their films won awards. Like, How the hell did they win awards? What, that's not that special. And then we, we learned you have to pay to enter. And you go, oh. And so the government was entering everything. And so we started entering awards for our films and started to win because our films were very visual, very, because uh, I love cameras and my partner was a brilliant editor. Um, and because they won awards, people started buying them, paying attention to them, not because of the films, but because they were award winning. Mm -hmm. So we learned again, getting an advocate, getting somebody to say, okay, I've won three awards and this is my new project is much easier than saying this is my new project. Or my, um, uh, you know, my advocate uh, is this, you know, filmmaker in Hollywood who has, who's, uh, is going to stay with me and mentor me through this process. And he wanted me to reach out to you. That, that it's easier if you have somebody who is respected or you have something you've achieved that you can put through. I was the top person in my films class every year for five years, Wh whatever it is that makes you valuable so that they can see you as somebody they want to work with. Yeah, thank you. You were talking about being creative consultant. How is that uh, position different from creative producer and what does it entitle? Well, I don't think there's anything that rules these things into a specific approach. In other words, I've, I've worked with other people who are directors. And, um, you know, I worked with Todd on a, on a movie where um, my, my uh, effort was as a producer, as a creative producer, was to be his ally in getting him to his dreams on the screen. Yeah. And because I've been there as a director and I've had people nag at me to get through the day in a hurry because our budget's going to get over or we're going to go into golden time, um, I know what's going on. So I would position myself never to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. My goal was and never to talk to the actors mm. because they know I'm a director. And so um, my, my thing would be, I would stand way back, watch the scene, watch what's going on, wait and see if Todd wants some input. When he looks at me, I'll go, that's good. Or I'll go and he'll come over and we'll say, you know, what are you, what are you feeling Todd? first question is, I'm not there to take it away, I'm there to push him forward. Do you think you got what you wanted? And I go, yeah, but I, you know, and I say, well, you know, hey, I, I felt that you were so close when he was doing this, maybe you could ask for more of that. Mm -hmm. But it's easier in a way to be out of the center of the orbit because he's thinking everything. He's got camera, he's got, you know, all, all these different elements going on. And I'm able to look at it sometimes and just see, you know, if you, I, you know, a little more hesitation before that line came out might make it much more truthful. He looks like he knows what he's going to say in a situation where that isn't real. And so, yeah, that's cool. Thanks. You know, but it's never to take it away. It's to make strength in his vision. Mm -hmm. So um, a creative consultant is really, um, you know, a way of taking uh, someone else's work and trying to make it stronger to their vision and okay. using the tools that you've got over a lifetime of, um, knocking your head against your own failures. You know, scripts don't throw together. Edits don't throw together. Your worst edit is usually the first one you look at and you want to go kill yourself. And then, you know, you put more effort in, you find someone else who's got a vision for your material and they, you start to see that, you know, it's better than you thought it was. And then you build on what they've done. Um, it's just not a straight path. Mm -hmm. It's a concerto of things. It's not one instrument, you know, it takes, Film takes a whole orchestra. Mm -hmm. You have to be the conductor, but that doesn't mean to say you have to play every instrument. You just have to try and let sometimes the instruments help you get to your goals so that you're not overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. What about when you're playing several instruments, which you have done uh, yeah. quite a number of times, uh, how do you uh, maintain objectivity uh, and also a low stress level when you have so many responsibilities, especially when you're both producing, writing, directing. It, it's very challenging. 
And a lot of aspiring uh, filmmakers are doing that. Yes, and, and, yeah. and that's, you know, they're doing what we do when we started out. Yeah. And so, you know, my, my answer to you is if you have a passion for doing this and you keep doing it and you give up your weekends to go make films and edit them on your iPhone and you show them to people and they laugh and they cry and they get involved, you're, you're growing. This is real stuff. Um, it, in, I, I say to people, making a film is solving a million problems. If you think you're going to walk on that set and solve problems and not have problems, you're going to be very demoralized very quickly. And I've seen other people say the same thing. You know, you went there with the dream and you had that it was going to be a, a sunny day and it's actually raining. So do you give up and give up, throw away sixty, eighty, hundred, twenty thousand dollars and say, oh, let's all go home? Or do you go, fuck, how do I make the rain work? <laughs> and so you suddenly turn around and say, listen, I want everybody to wear thin clothing. I want it all be soaked. And I want them to be able to see their skin through the things so that when they move, da, 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 da. and I don't know where the answers come from. And that's one of the strange things is when you're inside the choices, your fear is that someone will ask you a question you don't know the answer to. And when they do answer the, ask you the question frequently, you didn't know that was in you until they asked. And so on my Houdini movie, we went through 26 different costume changes for Bass Houdini. Wow. With the wardrobe guy, and we're going down the line. And he's saying, well, she wears this in this scene. And she, the very beginning is Houdini's wife comes to the 10th anniversary seance of, her, of his death to be there and to be the participant. And my costume designer has little shiny things on her dark costume and say, she's not wearing frivolous things. She's not dressed up. She, this is the biggest event in her life because it's the final time she'll ever deal with her husband's death. That's a possibility of reaching out to him. She's not, she's not decorated. Yeah. And I didn't know I would know that until I saw it. And as soon as he took that off, she's present. And, and I can't tell you why I know that. Well. So, um, but I do know that my fear of not knowing the answers has held me back. My fear is that I'm going to work with a star and he's going to think I'm an incompetent idiot. And he's going to scream at me and I shouldn't want to do that. Maybe I should never make a movie. Um, I'm glad you shared yeah. that because it is it is scary, especially when you're starting out. You dream to get named talent, but when you yeah. do get named talent, you're like, ah, what if I do something wrong and they're just gonna turn around and leave? Yeah. <laughs> so it's scary. Yeah. I'm glad yeah, we've, you had, we've had named talent would come out of their trailers, and you have to go figure it out. Yeah. We had named talent that I gave permission to go off script, and they went so far off script that there wasn't any script, <laughs> and and then we called lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I go meet with them because I've invited them to go off script and I say that was really great there were some wonderful things there but I'm not getting the clarity I need to be able to edit it and so you tell the truth but you don't put them down yeah yeah and um you know it, it is um I'm terrified of making a movie it's going to war it's like an endless fight every day you get up and you hate yourself because you didn't get all the dreams that you wanted in the can but you edit what you actually got, which is frequently different from what you thought it would be. And it doesn't look the same when you get it on film and take it to the editing room. And then you realize that you juggle it around. My partner had won more awards for his editing than any other editor in Canada at that time. We'd done this thing about making sure that our moves were really tight, full of imaginative cuts. And he'd taken my drama and cut every pause out. And this was the very first time I'd ever written a drama I didn't write. The screen was not, the screenplay was not formatted as a normal screenplay. The television people took it because the strength of the story was powerful and they didn't care that that formatting. Um, I'd never worked with an actor and I'd never worked with a, a drama crew. So I got all my documentary friends to work with me and none of us knew what we were doing. It was horrible. It was painful as hell because we weren't, we were trying to invent how to shoot dramas instead of working with the models. Yeah. And the, so every day was painful and hard. And then the edit, my partner, by taking out all the pauses, which always worked when we did action movies, made the whole thing dead. And I'm going, oh my God, I've let all these people down. What a moron I am. I should never direct again. This is a horrible mistake. Um, and then I, and I said to my partner, what, 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 wait a minute, let's just look at one scene. So we look at one scene and I says, well, what, what does the actor look like before he says that line? And he goes, because in those days, you had to tear the tape off the film, separate it, go look for the piece which was taken away, put it back on, snap it in, put it back on the editing machine. And we looked at it and it looked like he was thinking. 
And I go, oh my God. So we went through the entire movie, what I call doctoring. I thought I was salvaging my bad movie by putting in all the things where these characters seem to have emotional moments to think, taking a cutaway from another scene that was later on in the, in the movie, which was taking place in the same. The story is, um, about a, about a trainer who's very broke, run down. He owns one thoroughbred horse, which is in foal, which means it's pregnant, to a very, very famous male stud. And so it's worth a fortune to him, and maybe it's his, his career. And it's the night when he thinks the horse has colic, which is a tummy problem, and he calls in the vet, and his regular vet doesn't turn up, but it's a woman who he's never met before who's his standby, and she says, it's giving birth, it's not colic. And then she discovers it's a breech birth. And they have 10 minutes, 20 minutes at best to either turn the foal inside the mare or choose which one to kill. Yeah. And that, um, so a lot of it took place inside a barn with flashbacks to the career this man had had with his horse and why he owed it. And um, the, in the barn we had, uh, I could go and steal a look from my actor from another scene and put it in so I could make a creative pause so that I could make something that was being glossed over more powerful and more emotional. But I honestly thought I docked in my movie. And then it was reviewed um, uh, as the best movie of any length ever shown on the CBC in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, eh, no, no, you don't understand. <laughs> oh, no fool here just managed to throw one out and um that's when norman jewison saw it and said hey want to go to hollywood and i'm going ah, i know this is all a big mistake you don't want me um you know and then having to uh, climb over those things and realize that actually i actually have good film instincts but i didn't know it yeah because if i could look backwards now i said oh, no i consist i fuck up i consistently do a good one i fuck up i consistently do a good one so, and it, if you told me at the beginning of my life that I would end up in Hollywood, people going, oh, you did Hollywood, oh, that's amazing. And I go, I wouldn't expect that to be me, you know? What would be your guidance for the actors who will be auditioning for one of your projects in the future? What, besides those micro emotions that you've mentioned? Well, you know, I think it's, uh, when I'm casting, I'm very careful not to cast anybody who I don't see actually illustrate the behavior that makes my character come to life. Mm -hmm. um, I was working with Paul Sabino on my Houdini movie, mm -hmm. and um, uh, he, had a, he had a reputation for being tough on directors, mm -hmm. and um, I've never felt like I was a confident to take charge. I always felt that my goal was to work with the actor and find what way they worked best and to use that to help pull my characters out of them. And I told Paul that I wanted his support and uh, I was watching him reading a, uh, lines on my project and I didn't feel it. I was watching and it just didn't feel it. And I know if you don't feel it, it's not there. It's not there on the screen. So I went to him and I always whisper to my actors, I never say out loud. So the other actors are not hearing what I'm saying because each of them is a different soul like your intelligence is. What I say to him might fuck that one up. So, you know, I, I, each of them are precious and each of them are like a different instrument. So I'd say to Paul, you know, I'm not seeing it. And he said, sit under the camera. Hmm. Don't look at the monitor. So I sat under the character. He read the scene again. It was identical the way he read it and everything was there. Wow. So you couldn't see it on the monitor. It's too small. Wow. But in the reality of it, he knew and again, it's all about this gut instinct. You're a director, you watch it. Does it tell the truth? Does it make you feel those mirror neurons far enough? Are you engaged in the micro expressions? But you're not saying that, you're saying, is it live? Is it real? Are those words coming out of that person's mouth? And if they're not, you gotta chase it till it feel real. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see actors talking about reality as being a very important part of what they're, what they're fighting for. And you can find a reality in any, you can play the same scene four or five different ways because Hamlet is paid over and over again. What they do is they find different realities. He's a nervous wreck. He's an overconfident idiot. He's, you know, but you can interpret those words many different ways that will always come back to human nature is behaving in some way that causes us to pay attention. Um, I have an immense 
uh, admiration for actors. I'm a coward. I hide behind the camera. I send my scripts out to audition so I don't have to be there when they're rejected. Those guys get up and do the real thing. And then they turn around and they trust me with their lives because I can make an idiot out of them in the editing room or I can make them genius. And um, it's a gift. So I have a great deal of um, uh, authenticity in terms of my admiration for them. I, it's a privilege to work with actors. Mm -hmm. And how does but, it work um, after the uh, audition room where you're not present? Uh, so you get the ones that were selected by casting and what makes you feel like this is it? Is there something about presentation, about greeting, about something about the way they are in the audition room that could make you choose them? Like you said, with pitching, you know, yeah, there are ways- well, Sometimes to it's indefinable. You know, you, 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 um, you know, you, you look at, so you, you introduce people at a party and you know that person's interesting and that one isn't. Mm. It only takes a flash sometimes or they open their mouths and you go, oh, fuck, you know? <laughs> um, so uh, I, I had the privilege of making my movie Houdini and I was told by um, TNT that they wanted directors to have total creative control of their movie as long as they met the budget. And um, so, and they helped me, they were a great lady helping me cast called Ira Grossman. And we brought in semi-stars, people that were really well-known, read the role, it was wooden. Read the role, it was wooden. And, and it just didn't fire me up and I was getting quite depressed. And then Jonathan Sheck came in and he said he had a cold and he wasn't feeling good and he really didn't want to read. And I begged him and he read two lines and he said, no, I'm not gonna go in. And I knew in those two lines that that man had more magic going on for my vision of my character than any of the other people I met. Wow. And he left. And um, if he chooses to share why and how that happened with you at some point, that would be wonderful. And I still refused to hire him, but I asked if I could have a coffee with him and if he could continue to read somewhere else under less pressure. And we sat at a table at a Starbucks outdoors and he started reading again because I'm not gonna put a person in a role, in any role, in my movie because every every role is responsible for the success of the movie that I don't believe in. So um, he started reading again, confirmed what I believed. This man had a different way of speaking in, in those words that brought uh, things out of it that I couldn't feel from anybody else. Yeah. Put, put that into words, I don't know how to. Yeah, no, I, ju I guess you're right. It's just that bond that you either have or don't, like when you meet a person just in a normal situation and that person is it or not it. Yeah. That's and, and that's what makes stars and doesn't make stars. Sometimes the camera just loves somebody. Um, and sometimes they're, you know, you can watch them over and over again. Sean Connery, Steve McQueen, you know, Tom Cruise. They're, they're always supposed to be different people each time, but something works, we like it. Mm -hmm. And some of it's familiarity because you don't have to regroup somebody's face in. They you already know the gestures, you know, it's like you already know the little things and you can glean quicker. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it is magical. And, then, and in casting, the other thing I've noticed, and I'm going to say this, the people that overdress up or over, you know, emphasize their sexuality are usually not the people that have got the best performance because they're emphasizing what they have that they believe is the best thing they can sell you. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen women come in with a very low cut and I, and I go, so, and they read, they don't have it. And I've seen women come in covered, covered in clothes that they wanna hide their femininity and they have it in spades because mm -hmm. they don't want you to mistake what they're selling as their craft by getting sex in the way. Wow. And, and um, that's a good practical advice. Yeah, don't go for the, yeah. the, the easy solution. Go for the one that makes you feel like this person is real. Yeah, thank you. So the mistakes that you've made, which you are willing to share that our viewers can learn from so that they avoid them in the future. You know, well, I, I just think as I said at the beginning, the biggest mistake is not making uh, the choice to make um, uh, yourself push yourself to places which are uncomfortable. Um, I, when I was trying to make my Houdini movie, I was so scared I put, I must get a thousand rejections. And my, I told my assistant every day, push me, push me because I'm not courageous. Um, the um, mistakes are 
uh, not to hold over yourself your mistakes, because in film, we're, we look at mistakes as being fixable. You know, we, we, we're in a medium where rewrites are normal. It's not like you made mistakes that you need rewriting. Is that mistakes? Are you wrong? Or is this part of the process of growing? And I've noticed as I write, I get new intuitions and new insights on material that I love. And I suddenly go, holy crow, why didn't I see that before? But I'm grateful because that makes my material even stronger. And so, again, it's, it, the mistake is not trying as opposed to believing that making a mistake is an indi indicative of a failure. There's so many screenplays out there. So you say, my mistake is I didn't write the right screenplay because it didn't get made. That is an absolutely unsupportable, unevidenced piece of um, you know, self-defeat because you just know that the chances of you, like a roulette wheel, of putting your script in the right place with the right coins, with the right bet, is so small in this business that you have to accept that 90% of the time, the scripts are not going to sell. Right. Which comes back to, again, why are you doing this? <laughs> it has to be that you're investing in yourself as a human being, learning about being a shaman. Because we are the people that interpret ourselves as human beings to other people so they can learn about their lives. We're the people that teach morals. We're the people that teach what love and respect is between men and women, children and husbands. We're the people that teach what monsters are and what monsters need in order to be able to overcome them, which means incredible courage. And I say, no one would remember David if Goliath was five foot six. So the bigger you create your monster, the more you demonstrate how much human courage it takes to overcome it. So these things are gorgeous things, but not to believe that you failed, um, you know, because you can't be in every, it, there just isn't enough space. If you want to write books, you have a better chance probably of self-publishing and at least taking control of your life. But you didn't. You chose something that cost millions of dollars to do. And so you must do it for yourself. Yeah. And every time you do something, it grows you as a human being when you write from that dangerous place, when you write from that inner journey and say, what, what is the most scary thing I could write? What's the most confessional, the most wild thing? Because wild becomes quite normal quite quickly when you get used to it. And so fresh is important. So pushing yourself to be different is great. When we first came to Hollywood, we um, were working with Stallone because I, I, I met him when we were, I was working with Norman Jewison and St I showed Stallone some of our documentary films and he really liked our work because we were so non-Hollywood. And um, he brought us in to consult on Paradise Alley, which was a wrestling movie he did before he brought us in to help him fix Rocky II, which was having problems. And that, um, that process of learning from other people was that frequently um, the system was kind of geared against people here. Um, we were stunned that an editing assistant couldn't be an editor for six years. We're going, hey, if you're a really good editor, why would you, you know? Um, and we, we saw that people were um, overcome when they didn't have a lot of script and they had a large action sequence. So in Rocky II, we had 2 million feet of people punching each other, but the editors were having trouble assembling. But we went and looked at it as we would do in our documentary world and said, where's the emotion? Where's the best shots? Where's the things that, that have key elements? How do we tell the story through the faces of the people that are invested in the heroes? And where's the material that keeps the heroes at the risk of failure, the longest. And then we re-edited the, all the Rocky II fight scenes um, with our documentary sense of drama. And we built to an orgasm at the end. And um, we were given control of the movie by Stallone because the guys who were editing it were good editors, but they were used to script. And they were used to, the script becomes the bus. You get on the bus and this takes you to these places. Well, now suddenly you've just got this chasm filled with film and we go, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, making mistakes, um, being arrogant, uh, not listening to people, um, not sometimes firing people that should be taken off your crew um, because your crew is a, is a sailing ship. And if they're not helping each other, some, you're letting the ship down and that's your responsibility as the person in charge is to take the hard things 
a letting somebody go if you're an empathy if you're an empath like me it's very hard because you look at their career and you look at their feelings you look at their family and all you know and at the same time you look at all the effort of everybody else that's going in you say i have to do this for the sake of the bigger picture of the investment that everybody's making um the mistakes are um sometimes putting something out that embarrasses you later you realize you made a fool of yourself and you showed off that you didn't know what you were doing but but you know it's it's more it's mostly the other way around that's a hard one because you're thinking it's for something really great sometimes <laughs> and yeah but that's why you check it um you know you 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 have to allow that being wrong is okay yeah. you have to allow that you know you're entitled to some mistakes yeah. otherwise you freeze up paralysis analysis is a term you know um but if you if you say uh, what the fuck i'm going to try it see what happens i'm going to learn um you know a cold call is really just an introduction to someone you don't know well yet if you do it right but a cold call to someone you've done no effort to research you've done no effort to try and find out where you're what you're trying to sell would actually fit into their lives is a is a dead call because you really have shown no respect And again, you've got a screenplay. There are two two issues about screenplay writing. One is agents and managers are not interested in a screenplay. Their 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 goal is not to sit there and say, "I'm going to champion this script because they know it can take 15, 20, 50 years on one script." They're interested in the writer because if they give that screenplay and you've got three or four more pieces of writing which are really good, and they can go to a studio and say, "You know, I'd love you to know about this writer. There's a project that she's got to sell, but also you'll see that her writing style is really unique and original. And then they will bring you in for a meeting. And what you'll find out is that they'll be talking about your screenplay. They've all read it, and at the end of the meeting they'll say, "Now we've got this project we've got some problems with. Would you like to look at it?" Because really they were auditioning you to see whether they wanted to work with you to fix their problems on their screenplay. And that's what the agent is selling. Selling a writer not a screenplay. Yeah. And that and and now you can do this pretty much by Zoom. So you don't even have to turn up in Hollywood. Um and but if you think that they're selling screenplays and you've written one screenplay and that's going to be your ticket, you've got a really hard road. It's possible, you know, things have happened. Stallone wrote Rocky and managed to hold on to it and got the movie made. Um, yeah. you know, it's it, it 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 can happen. But the real thing is that most of the time it's a career and people want to sell you over and over and over again and they want you to come with a certain number of fresh written material so they can introduce you to their buying teams the agents the, the people at Netflix so the people at, and they say listen they've just written this why not take a look because maybe he'll fit into one of your writers rooms or she'll fit into you know this new project that you're trying to get done and her voice might be the one you're looking for the second room is um is to look at and there's a thing called IMDb Pro which is a uh, across the board database of material about people in the business mm-hmm. and you see a film by somebody that you admire you can look up what they what else they've done on that database you can look up frequently what the address of their company is and so directors producers and writers frequently have companies and there are people in those companies whose job it is to find work not work but to find works um uh, materials that might make their actor shine or their director have a new sense of discovery and joy and want to champion and so those people are open to spec scripts they're not going through the system and again you can get around that by either writing so that you're saying you know i understand you know that i should i'll write a release if this is something you're interested in so you go around having to have an agent or, or but by going directly to the development execs in that place whose job it is to find something extraordinary for their boss and you and you try and sell yourself in those terms actresses are looking for roles that people won't let them do people like morgan freeman who i worked with twice said i want to do the things that no one would let me do anybody can do the stuff that you know there's no stimulus in doing what i've already done So, you know, after Robin Hood, everybody wanted me to do more, you know, bow bow and arrow adventures and I'm going, "Hey, no, I want to do this." You know, which is about X or Y. Um, you know, and I have a wide beam of things that are magical to me. Um, so you're you're 
in a unique place when you realize that these, uh, a lot of actresses now have companies. And if you've seen what they've, what they've already done and you've seen their career, you can guess that your new material would challenge them. An actor likes to be a little bit scared. So if you give them what they exactly just did, they'll hate you for it. Because they'll say, you don't think I have any talent that I'm just trapped in this boring repetition. They're not gonna be grateful. They're gonna think of what, what an insult that is. If you give them something they've never done, but it looks possibly on the spectrum of what might intrigue them, then yeah, there's a chance that you could sell them your material in a one-off situation. That, that's, that's a really interesting way of thinking when you're considering actors for your, for your work that look, think outside the box. It's you, 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 just natural to think of the actors who have played someone similar to a character, but actually thinking- well, going, going against type is a joy for these people. Yeah. You know, comedians are desperate to be taken seriously. Um, and if they have a large enough box office, then, you know, they can take a chance every now and again. You know, it, it's just, uh, but also you're selling your material to their company and their company has the contacts. Their company has the people that want to make that actor happy because they want to keep them in their series on Netflix, which is getting good numbers. And so they will develop things for them. Um, and you, you may be the person that's getting developed because they want to keep a relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. This, this, would, this was fantastic. I mean, these are not even mistakes. These are just steps to follow. So thank you. It's, 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 you know, I think mistakes is a horrible thing because yeah. um, we, we, as I said, in the film business, we take this angle, how many shots? Well, we might do this tape, then this tape, then this tape. So we're all fucking idiots, right? Because we need to do more than one take. No. Making mistakes is normal. Making yeah. mistakes should be how we get to the good part. Yeah. Not this, this is an indictment of us because we needed more than one take. Mm -hmm. And we shoot different angles. Why? Because different angles make different discoveries. Therefore, we're really stupid because we have to take all these different things. We don't know what's going to work yet. Yeah. That's the process. Mm -hmm. And not being scared to learn and not being indicted by the process and saying, I don't know what I'm doing. In fact, it's easier to say, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know I'm going to get there. Yeah, that, that, that's a good way to look at it. Thank you. You know, my life changed once I had children. I was really scared having children that I would try and be forced to give up my creative freedom, mm -hmm. that I should be responsible and get a job and hold down making money. But in fact, what it did is it opened a door in my soul that said, you know, the stories that I'm creating are t talking to the country of the world that my children would grow up in. Yeah. And they instructed me about uh, what, what the enormous power of life is. And it's no accident that Robin Hood has a birth scene in it, which is a cesarean birth brought about by the Morton Freeman character. Mm -hmm. And that's metaphorically my son being born, my Mal Flanders movie, has a birth scene where Mal gives birth to a daughter. And that's metaphorically my daughter being born. And those scenes make me cry. And again, that's what I really think, you know, that, that was the, the in, in Robin Hood, the birth scene was the first scene the director didn't want to shoot. Didn't think it was a waste of time. And I'm, and I'm going, um, so I really feel that this film is about that baby and Robin Hood being willing to die for its future. So I've got a kind of dichotomy here. So I, I get sort of like, without getting in the director's face, I talk to Costner and he decides to push a little bit because he's had kids. Mm -hmm. And so we get it shot. It's the scene that they didn't cut into the movie. And I go to a screening um, and we're chatting and uh, actually it was at a, it was a, ended up at a meeting at, at Warner Brothers with the two top guys at Warner Brothers and everybody responsible for the movie. And I'm um, sitting there and I'm, and I'm just beside myself because I really, really want. And I go, you know, guys, there's something wrong with this room. And said, what are you talking about? And I said, 50% of humanity isn't represented here. There was not a woman in the room. And I said, we're trying to make a movie that appeals to both men and women. I would like a chance to cut the birth scene. And so everybody thought it was a waste of time. And I cut it and as low as the slowest I could get it down to was four and a quarter minutes. And uh, the movie was already over length. And in the 
industry of the film business, short movies sell better because they can put more audiences in seats in a day. And so we take it to a screening with the two haunches, the guy that run one is very big, powerful man. And the guy who financed the movies with us and the head of his company's there and my partners and, and everybody's looking at me like, you're wasting everybody's time. This is really stupid. So we screen the birth scene, four and a half minutes. I'm screaming, I'm like, oh. And then I see the guys at the front, the two Warner Brothers guys chatting with each other. I think, here comes the execution. And then they lean around, they say, you know, we tested Doc Hollywood last week and there was a birth scene in that. The audience loved it. Put it in. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I've felt the same way about Sean Connery. Yeah. Um, if people have seen the movie. Uh, Sean Connery is the person who turns up at the end to play Richard the Lionheart. And the director wanted John Cleese for that role. And I thought, you know, if we make a movie where the movie comes down to a joke, then the value of that birth scene, the value of the, uh, the humanity of Robin being willing to die for the future of children and loving Maid Marian is turned into a joke. And so I fought very hard to get Sean Connery and I went out of my way, again, overcoming my self-doubt, my fear, um, and um, ended up that I was able to get the guys who represented Sean to make a deal where he would work for one day. And that's why he was in the film. Wow. And that's because some part of my soul was in the movie, not because I thought it was a commercial idea. Yeah, that's, that's really inspiring. And you've been immensely courageous in your path. Oh, no, because there's that's love. what you're thinking, but yeah. this is strength. This is power. This is, yeah. this is what drives it all. <laughs> I can't do it every day. I can't do it, you know, months in sometimes. You no. did it when you had to, and yeah. it yes. worked. Yes, when you had to. When you get to that place where there's no alternative and no one else is going to take responsibility, and you've got so much invested that's your pure soul, yeah. then you do it. Yeah, I, I mean, that's really what it is. You're bringing your soul on the table and then you need it to flourish and then yeah. fly, you know? And that's what you really did. And that, that's yeah. really moving. I think your masterclass has inspired many to just sit down right now and pour that soul out on that piece of paper. Well, final draft in our case, yeah. but, Thank you very much for, for this amazing, amazing, powerful, I mean, I can't say speech, there was a lot of questions, but just, it was really moving. It, I, I'm sure it, it really helped many to really put them on the right path, answered many questions that unfortunately many aspiring filmmakers don't get answers to because that's something that you learn with experience on set, but to get to that set, <laughs> You need many of these answers. So thank you so much for taking time and sharing your path and your words of guidance and your words of wisdom. And uh, I really hope that we're gonna see in a couple of years, maybe a little more, <laughs> but many fantastic screenplays that are gonna come out from this masterclass. Thank you very much, Pam. That's wonderful, Maria. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. And I, and I just, you know, I just think that people like you helping others like me when I was starting out, were incredibly valuable. So this is very, it's meaningful me to see you doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your kind words. And I, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm really moved by people like you who are happy to help this mission. So thank you. It's a teamwork. It's a team effort. And thank you everyone for watching.